Welcome everyone to today's special webinar, which is co-hosted by APCAT, that is Asia Pacific Cities Alliance for Tobacco Control and NCD Prevention, and APCAT Media, that is the Asia Pacific Regional Media Network to End Tuberculosis and Tobacco and Prevention Cities. The General Diabetes Day 2019 was yesterday. This day is observed every year on 14th of November, which is the birthday of Sir Frederick Banting, who co-discovered insulin along with Charles Bess in 1922. The theme for this year's World Diabetes Day is family and diabetes, with three main focus areas, discover diabetes, prevent type two diabetes, and manage your diabetes. The ninth edition of the World Diabetes Atlas was also released by the International Diabetes Federation yesterday. And today we are honored to have with us a galaxy of experts who will not only share the latest diabetes data, but also enlighten us as to how we can better prevent and control diabetes and how diabetes impacts other disease conditions. I also request the participants to please keep sending your questions and comments via the chat function, even as the panelists are presenting, and no need to wait till the end. Now, without much ado, let us hear from our speakers on why diabetes care and control is an imperative for human health. We are indeed honored to have with us today an eminent panel of experts, and they are Subi Karuranga, Epidemiology Manager, International Diabetes Federation, and also a member of the editorial team of the ninth edition of the Diabetes Atlas, which was released yesterday. Then we have with us Dr. Hema Debakar, spokesperson for IDF in Southeast Asia and technical advisor to Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. Next, we have Shri Dr. Anup Mishra, President of Diabetes Foundation India and Chairman Fortis. CDOC Center of Excellence for Diabetes, Metabolic Diseases, and Endocrinology, Delhi. And we have with us Dr. Tara Singh Baum, Deputy Regional Director, Asia Pacific Region at the International Union Against Tuberculosis and Lung Disease, which is commonly known as the Union. Then again, knowing very well that political commitment is vital for health security, including diabetes control and prevention. We will begin our webinar by listening to Barrister Shamim Haider Patwari, a member of parliament from Bangladesh, who is also part of the recently formed Asia Pacific Parliamentarians Caucus for Tobacco Control and NCD Prevention. Hi everybody, uh, today is World Diabetes Day and a significant day in health um, education and health prevention policy and health policy. Um, all over the world, we have been uh, celebrating this uh, this day, uh, but with a cautionary note, uh, with a warning that all over the world the diabetic patient is increasing. All over the world, the food habit, the lifestyle is is supportive for for increase of number of diabetic patients, and we have to go for a lifestyle. We have to go for preventive and early detective still in Bangladesh. Um, the Bardem and other institutions have been very well in combating diabetics, but still. We have millions and thousands of patients who don't know they have diabetics. Still, we have patients who become blind and then get to know the reason for blindness is diabetics. Still, we have patients who uh, face kidney problem and then came to know that the reason for the kidney problem is we have diabetics for long before. Now, we have to adopt a early detectable, a preventable, and a modifiable approach. Only then we can combat diabetics and other non communicable diseases. And also, we have to use the health-related data. In, in Israel, we are using now um, uh, health data and are predicting uh, kidney problems five years ahead, and that has huge impact on on on, on health policy. Uh, in Bangladesh, also, we need a universal health coverage system or universal health database system, where every citizen will be checked uh, whether he got diabetes or not, whether he have any cancer uh, detection problem or any symptom for cancer, whether he got any heart diseases, whether he got any high blood pressures and diabetics is one of the major NCD that uh, we need to defer that, uh, we need to 
take a healthy lifestyle. Our food must be diabetic friendly. The restaurants must, must be diabetic friendly. The food policy and safe food policy should include the food which is diabetic friendly. Many restaurants at the moment you can see they provide food uh, with mixing sugar and other things that is prone to uh, high blood sugar. And also it is high time on the World Diabetic Day we should unleash the technology that is helping or that has been recently been invented for diabetic prevention or diabetic control. And it is important that there should not be any copyright or patent uh, for this technology. Unleashing the technology uh, and bringing the medical solution should be the main theme of this day. And uh, it is important that the company should not create a monopoly or a syndication on this medical product. It is important that this innovation, this novelty and this, uh, this new technology, new medicines and uh, uh, should be used uh, and open up uh, for every citizen of the world uh, to combat diabetes. Also, it is important uh, that we should supplement the traditional uh, yoga, meditation and herbal treatment or herbal medicines, herbal food styles, herbal lifestyles. We should supplement that with our dietary process and with our treatment process. Only then we can really combat diabetes. In the upcoming days, we want a diabetic control nation, even if we can't prevent it, but we need to control it. And on this day, I like to invite all the stakeholders. Uh, it, we need a holistic and multi sectoral approach to, to combat the diabetic epidemic uh, so that it be early detected, so that it be prevented if possible, and so that it be controlled. We need a con diabetic control nation. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Shamim. Uh, I now invite our first panelist for today, Subi Karuranga, Epidemiology Manager, International Diabetes Federation, and one of the editors of the ninth edition of the Diabetes Atlas. Uh, Subi, please share with us some of the main findings of this latest Diabetes Atlas, including some regional data, uh, perhaps from the African region. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, very clearly. All right. Um, happy belated World Diabetes Day, everyone, and uh, happy uh, Diabetes Awareness Month. Uh, since last year, IDF has been um, celebrating instead of just one day for a full month, actually. IDF Diabetes Atlas has been published since 2000, and yesterday we have launched the ninth edition. Besides uh, 170 pages printed and electronic publication, Atlas tools also consist of advocacy guide, regional and global fact sheets, scientific articles and postures, and interactive website and data portal. All the materials are free to download from diabetesatlas.org website. With over hundreds of thousands of downloads, each edition has remained the most quoted source of information on the impact of diabetes and related conditions. IDF Diabetes Atlas uses age stratified <coughs> data and systematic methods to estimate the diabetes prevalence among people aged 20 to 79 years. This time, 255 data sources, mainly peer-reviewed published studies from 138 countries, and uh, territories fulfill the established inclusion criteria. Data sources are from countries that account for over 93% of the global population. For countries where data sources were not available, prevalence was extrapolated based on data sources from similar countries. According to the updated estimates, IDF estimates that in 2019, one in 11 adults have diabetes, one in two adults are undiagnosed, three in four people with diabetes live in low and middle income countries, 10% of global health expenditure is spent on diabetes, one in 13 adults have impaired glucose tolerance, one in three people with diabetes are above 65 years old, over a million children and adolescents have type 1 diabetes, and one in six live births are affected by hypoglycemia and pregnancy. Diabetes is one of the fastest growing health challenges of the 21st century, with the number of adults 
living with diabetes having more than tripled over the past 20 years. In 2000, global estimate of adults living with diabetes was 151 million. By 2009, it had grown by 88% to 285 million. Today, we calculate that 9.3% of adults aged 20 to 79 years, a staggering 463 million people are living with diabetes. A decade ago, in 2010, the global projection for diabetes in 2025 was 438 million. Five years still to go, that prediction has already been surpassed by 25 million. Currently, IDF estimates that there will be 578 million adults with diabetes by 2030 and 700 million by 2045. <coughs> diabetes prevalence is expected to increase in all countries. If current trends continue, the largest increases will take place as economies transition from low to middle income status. As IDF president, Dr. Nam Cho states in his foreword of the IDF Diabetes Atlas, diabetes is a serious threat to global health that respects neither socioeconomic status nor national boundaries. People living with diabetes are at risk of developing a number of serious and life-threatening com complications, leading to an increased need for medical care, a reduced quality of life, and undue stress to families. In terms of the regional comparison, the IDF Middle East and North Africa region has the highest age-adjusted prevalence of diabetes in adults currently, 12.2%, which means one in eight adults are living with diabetes. The IDF Africa region has the lowest age-adjusted prevalence, uh, which is 4.7%, meaning one in 20 adults are living with diabetes. This can be partly attributed to lower levels of urbanization, undernutrition, and lower levels of obesity. However, the number of people with diabetes in African region is expected to increase 143% by 2045, the largest percentage increase among all regions over the same period. The increasing prevalence of diabetes worldwide is driven by a complex interplay of socioeconomic, demographic, environmental, and genetic factors. The continued rise is largely due to an upsurge in type, one, type 2 diabetes and related risk factors, which include rising levels of obesity, unhealthy diet, and widespread physical inactivity. However, levels of childhood onset type 1 diabetes are also on the rise. Inequalities in access to quality health care persist, particularly in low- and middle-income countries. Diabetes is often undiagnosed, misdiagnosed, or inadequately treated, with people unable to access the essential medicines and devices they need, resulting in complications and early death. Um, almost half of the 4.2 million people who were estimated to die from diabetes in this year were under the age of 60 years. The number is highest in Africa, where more than two in three of the people estimated to die due to diabetes prematurely. Diabetes also imposes a significant economic impact on countries, health systems, and when healthcare must be funded out of pocket, on people with diabetes and their families. 67% of adults with diabetes live in top 10 countries and also 70% of global diabetes-related health expenditure is spent in these countries. However, 87% of diabetes-related deaths occur in low- and middle-income countries, but only 35% of diabetes-related health expenditure is spent here. Premature death, disability, and other health complications due to diabetes are also associated with a negative economic impact for countries. It is estimated that these indirect costs of diabetes and an additional 35% to the annual expenditures associated with the condition. 
Sources of indirect costs include labor force dropout, mortality, absenteeism, and presenteeism, which means reduced productivity when at work. For people living with diabetes, concerns about managing the condition and fears of future complications and their potential impact on quality of life are significant contributors to the intangible costs of diabetes. These include worry, anxiety, discomfort, pain, loss of independence, and of other crucially important features of living with diabetes. It would not be possible to create a publication of this magnitude without our international group of diabetes experts across the world who have dedicated their time and insight during these past two years <coughs> to review the methods, collect the data, and analyze and report the findings. IDF Diabetes Atlas is offered for careful and considered use in the support of continued and enhanced action to improve the diabetes and those at risk of developing the condition. With this light, I would like to thank once more for the invitation to speak in this webinar. Thank you. Thank you, Suvi. I now welcome our next speaker, Dr. Hema Devakar, spokesperson for IDF in Southeast Asia and technical advisor to Ministry of Health and Family Welfare, Government of India. Namaskar, I bring you greetings from Southeast Asia, India, and of course, my entire IDF fraternity who have put this great piece of work together and our umbrella parent organization FIGO which is a federation of OBGYNs consisting of 140 countries which have tied up with the IDF. So taking a cue from where Suvi has left us, uh, I sincerely acknowledge and thank everybody to have given us an opportunity to share this platform. As we go along my presentation, I will certainly respond to the question posed by our moderator, Shobha. Being an OBGYN, my main focus, of course, will be to focus on the Southeast Asian situation, particularly affecting the women and diabetes. So the objective of this presentation is the issue the challenge and the solutions. The issue is the mind boggling numbers from the IDF Atlas, the relevance of maternal health in the context of diabetes and NCDs. The challenge is the healthcare expenditure as we have outlined in the IDF Atlas, the barriers of operating at the individual societal system and different stages in the GDM care. And I'll tell you more about why we need to invest in the pregnant women to uh, nurture the healthy generation next. And of course, lastly, we know the scale of the problems. We want to talk about the solutions. So the 75%, which is the projections made by the IDF, is waiting in the wings there to blow a tsunami, especially into the Southeast Asian region. And unless we have the solutions put into action, we must act today to change tomorrow. So going back data from our IDF Atlas just released yesterday to the 19th of November on the World Diabetes Day, the question was about the situation in Southeast Asia. Well, when we asked for the registration, a colleague from the United States who said, why are they making such a big issue of the diabetes situation in the low and middle income countries, whereas the problem is so mind boggling in the developed countries. Well, this is quite a myth because the Atlas very, very clearly mentions that three out of four people with diabetes indeed live in countries like ours, the low and the middle income countries. So the focus on these geographical regions is definitely not uncalled for. Coming to the scenario in pregnancy, so we already mentioned that one in six live births are affected. Mothers have high sugars or hyperglycemia in pregnancy. You'll see the first, the red bar, which represents the Southeast Asian region. More than 25% of our women who are pregnant have high sugars. South Asia is 11 times more prone to gestational diabetes. And the known figures in India are about 
four to five million pregnancies every single year with the high blood sugars. So this is indeed a challenging number and the issue is very, very big. So overall context, again, going back to the question from the moderator, situation of diabetes in Southeast Asia. Well, as you see here, China ranks first and India is ranking the second. The status of diabetes in India, over 80 million individuals who are afflicted by the type two diabetes. Half of them are women. So we may have about 40 million women, many more who are undiagnosed because the data in the Atlas clearly speaks about the individuals who don't even know that they have high sugars. So out of 40 million women, can you just imagine that half of them, that is over 20 million of them, had in the recent past high sugars in their pregnancy? Within two to five years, they have moved on to become a full-blown type to diabetes. So if you see the red bar here, the investment or the health expenditure which India or countries like India are doing on this massive problem is so minuscule. The problem is big, but we need to invest more time, more efforts and more money into tackling this problem as in prevention. Why are we speaking again and again about women and diabetes? When does the malady kick start? It is as if the female gender is the key to the diabetic prevention because as you would notice in this picture here, it is an intergenerational transmission. It all begins with this pregnant woman. If she has a hypertensive disorder or a hyperglycemia, that is any of the NCDs, her baby in her womb is programmed in a way to be projected as a high risk individual for childhood obesity and certainly, certainly at being at very high risk for obesity, killer disease and diabetes in very young adulthood, maybe 30, 35 and it, the diabetes situation unfolds. So about 70% of the type 2 diabetes by 2040 could be prevented if we take care of this pregnant, the child in the womb who should be programmed in a normal sugar environment rather than a... This will again indirectly imply on the total expenditure for every single family <coughs> or South East Asia <coughs> who have a low socioeconomic status, more than 753 US dollars per individual uh, would need to be spent. And the country itself has to spend millions of dollars in combating this menace of type two diabetes. So what is our best opportunity? What are the solutions? We pledged that we will not only talk about the problems and the challenges, but we will also use the opportunities such as pregnancy to handle on the solutions. So the maximum investment should be on the pregnant mother and the child in the womb. You will see in this life course approach here, dear friends, the bar here shows clearly the risk of NCDs, which is minimal with an early intervention. If you invest, the best time to invest in, is in the pregnant women and the mother. Test every pregnant woman, find out whether she has high sugars or not, manage her sugars well so that the next generation of the children born out of these women are less and less prone to the NCDs. If you lose your handle there, don't lose track of this woman and her offspring. Pay particular attention to the children born out of diabetic mothers or mothers with hyperglycemia in pregnancy because these are the children who are prone to childhood obesity. You track them and influence their lifestyle, you will still manage to prevent a large number of them from developing type 2. Well, if that opportunity is also lost, the preventive healthcare in the adulthood is absolutely a must in the South Asian region. As you see here, earlier you intervene, less are the chances of NCDs, more delay or no intervention, you will certainly land up with millions and millions adding on to the NCDs. So the best window of opportunity is indeed the pregnancy to address the intergenerational prevention of the NCDs such as diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disease, and stroke. 
But can it be done easily in Southeast Asia? We have special problems in our region. The problems are from the society itself, the gender of the women who are neglecting their own health, the awareness is low, the stigmatization is much higher and still prevailing. The practice and perceptions about the pregnant women have to eat for two because she has the baby nurturing is absolutely a wrong myth in the context of pregnancy diabetes. So there are inadequate resources, poor services, inequity, and the consequences are great. There are individual barriers. We talked about lifestyle, but there is lack of information about proper advice of diet and exercise. The food, which is healthy, may be costly, and many times the women deny these conditions. They're reluctant to accept the treatment inclusive of insulin. Lack of physical activity is a new era problem in countries like India. When we say that women in the society have to take care, we as healthcare providers also should be building our capacity to tackle the millions in the country. It's not good asking people to do something that they don't have the equipment, nor the time, nor the knowledge to do. So it is our duty as professional bodies to build the capacity of healthcare providers to set the guidelines, which indeed the Indian government has done. We have a set of recommendations of testing and managing the pregnancy with hyperglycemia. This is endorsed by FIGO. This is endorsed by National Organization FOPSI and also join hands with IDF to disseminate this far and deep. So the diagnosis, the quality of care, the pregnancy outcome goes a very, very long way in preventing the situation. So to conclude, the solutions would necessarily be not in developing a different vertical, but by integrating the women and child health care and linking it to the NCD care, promoting healthy lifestyle in adolescent girls and pregnant women to avoid both excessive and deficient nutrition and limiting the adolescent pregnancy, because women and girls indeed are the key agents in the adoption of healthy lifestyles to improve the health and well being of the future generations. We really lack the longitudinal data. We don't know what happens to these women who have hyperglycemia and pregnancy, and we have no clue what happens to their children. So the long-term tracking ought to have been there. We as obstetricians, yesterday were managing the maternal deaths and obstetric emergency. Today, we are talking about diabetes in pregnancy. If we don't do anything about it today, we will land up in tackling the cardiovascular diseases, obesity, hypertension, and diabetes tomorrow. There is a diabetes and obesity epidemic. So until and unless urgent action is taken, to systematically address these issues, we will be undoing all the good that we have done for maternal and infant mortality. So let us pledge to move from awareness to action, from illness to wellness. Let us collaborate. Let us do the much needed advocacy and awareness to the media and all the peer group and professional organizations. Let us build the capacity of healthcare providers. More research, more data, and more action is indeed called for. So thank you very much for your kind attention. And I do hope that I have placed my plea to everybody who is on this show to invest where the yield is the best. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hema. And I would just uh, like to add that maybe progress towards gender equity because that is an important part. And thank you for focusing on women. But we have to improve the health seeking behavior of women Absolutely. And unless we have gender equity and gender justice, I think we will lag there. Thank yes. you very much. Our next speaker is India's noted diabetologist, Padamshri Dr. Anup Mishra. He is president of Diabetes Foundation India and chairman Fortis CDOC, Center for Excellence for Diabetes, Metabolic Diseases and Endocrinology, Delhi. Uh, Dr. Mishra, in the wake of this new diabetes data, can you please share with us what India and other Asia Pacific region countries can do better for diabetes prevention, first of all, and then of course control. But uh, I believe we need to focus more on prevention. So, and what are the major bottlenecks uh, which you encounter, which you feel are there? Thank you, Shobha. Uh, thanks, uh, Suvi and Hema for uh, those wonderful lectures because uh, most of what I'm going to do, uh, what going, I'm going to say has been said earlier. What I'm, I'm going to do is to 
concentrate on some particular aspects, highlight them in the context of, uh, uh, you know, the India and um, is specifically um, uh, South Asia and developing country. So I hope uh, all of you can see this particular slide. And I'll, yes. I'll start fr from this particular slide that we all know. And by now, this is very clear from Subhi's lecture that there has been a rapid increase of diabetes in India, South Asia, other developing countries. And especially this has to be considered in the terms of existing social, economic, and now Shobha has already told, gender disparities and continued presence of communicable diseases. Now, this is a, a double geopardy which is going on. Uh, one hand, there is a communicable diseases which are ongoing or maybe escalating also, and the other hand is non communicable diseases. And challenges are being felt for both type 2 and type 1, but former becomes more formidable because of very high numbers and increasing numbers in all the countries. Now, um, I'll just summarize some of the roadblocks. I'm not going to uh, be very comprehensive. I'll touch upon some of the uh, aspects that I feel very passionate about also. Now, for example, they we all have been seeing the nutritional transition and all countries from Africa to South Asia, there's an increased intake of highly refined um, carbohydrates, sugars and trans fat and particularly low fiber. There have been other nutritional uh, problems uh, termed under nutrition transition and this is going on. This is not yet stopped and this is what one particular important facet which has fueled diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity and multiple other NCDs in India. Now physical activity of uh, people in South Asia in particular India I know uh, are suboptimal, markedly suboptimal, hence affect the skeletal muscles and they are sarcopenic and if you take sarcopenia itself the muscle uh, you know, thinning and muscle dysfunction, your weak muscle, that itself is an independent risk factor for diabetes. Uh, we have been told by Hema very nicely about adverse in utero and perinatal nutrition and which leads to subsequent diabetes and hypertension. And the, uh, the fourth big factor is migration from the uh, villages to the urban setting. And these are the urban underprivileged and which we have been studying for last 15 to 20 years, uh, they change from a very good physical activity and diet profile to adverse uh, profile and develop diabetes without much of a knowledge of it. And this is a group which is particularly affected nowadays. Now, uh, it, as far as Indians are concerned, why are uh, Indians are being talked about as very highly prone to diabetes? Indians, South Asia, other countries, even Africa, uh, it starts the diabetes is very adverse. Uh, starts earlier in life, maybe about a decade earlier than whites, often present with complication. And this is because of the late diagnosis and several are undiagnosed as has been very clearly uh, defined by Suvi. In South Asia, the insulin resistance, the act, inaction of insulin uh, is particularly common. And it, that's because of, though they may have lesser body weight than many of the Western counterparts, they have excess body fat and excess liver fat. This is particularly important, the role of liver fat which has come up. The other, other uh, thing which, which is particularly seen is a rapid con conversion from pre-diabetes to diabetes. So from normal to pre-diabetes, the pre-diabetes to diabetes is conversion is so fast, much faster than white population. And this uh, gives us a very clear window of opportunity for not only screening to detect those patients who are at high risk for developing diabetes like pre-diabetes, but presents opportunity for prevention at this cohort, uh, pre-diabetes. And the moment patient is diagnosed with diabetes, there's a now a, a, a very clear opportunity of reversal of diabetes through various means. Of course, South Asians have high prevalence of cardiovascular disease and so have many other ethnic groups in, in, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa there's a higher predilection for nephropathy. Infections are you know, uniformly common in all developing countries and diabetic foot remains a major problem with infect, infection in most of the countries. Now, uh, there is a, seems to be a failure of prevention. And though there are several programs going on, I've, I've visited most of the countries and I've seen the programs. Programs are going on, but uh, sometimes they are 
lacking directions and policies of healthcare need very, very clear direction, not focus presently on prevention, more on communicable diseases, makes sense to a certain degree, uh, degree and more, more uh, focused on treatment. There's a, shor a shortage and, uh, of and inadequately trained health manpower and clear cut, there is no guidelines for nutrition and physical activity, unlike in developed countries where the guidelines are very clearly set. And as has been talked uh, by Hema, that this should start from the childhood or children, adults, and there's near absence of school-based and nutrition exercise-related education programs. And uh, you can see in TV, plenty of audiovisual commercial which uh, sell energy dense or junk food. Now, overall, the diabetes control remains very poor in these countries. More than 60 to 80 percent of patients do not come under a good control category, and which also is true for blood pressure and cholesterol. Unless all three are controlled, the cardiovascular disease uh, uh, is bound to come to, to patients. So all three must be controlled along with diet and exercise. And outcomes are particularly poor in low socioeconomic strata, both in rural and urban areas. So what are the other challenges? Uh, poor management, poor compliance by the patient, poor rehabilitation, all combined together to have a poor outcome. Patients are they also have a certain attitude which must be corrected. There are cultural and social issues, wrong beliefs, religious beliefs and alternative medicines, etc. Uh, procrastination, fatalistic attitude, well, it's a God will or something like that. Non-adherence to prescribed treatment, I see daily, almost 20 to 30 percent of the patients are not adhering to prescribed treatment. Certainly, healthcare needs to buck up the, uh, the treatment and management. Uh, it's not prepared for. There is a, a few diabetes educators. Now, this is an important facet which is missing in, in the developing countries that diabetes educator who should give education to the patient, uh, they're not, it's not often the case, and very few doctors have it. L limited access or use to hemoglobin A1C and self monitoring of blood glucose because of cost. In, you know, prohibit a patient from achieving a proper control. And, and uh, this syndemic, syndemics are the most important. What are syndemic? The presence of two diseases, diabetes and tuberculosis, diabetes and HIV, or diabetes in, or chronic obstructive airway disease. Now, tuberculosis in particular, I'll just uh, take a minute over it. Uh, diabetes patients have poor immunity, they are more prone to tuberculosis, and those Patients with tuberculosis have more inflammation of body and which fuels elevation of sugar. So both feed on each other. Almost 50% of the TB cases globally may be linked to diabetes. And India has both, and both are feeding on each other. Both epidemics are growing. And hence, it is important that a patient with tuberculosis should be looked for diabetes, and a bladder Now, the other thing about disease, as you know, this uh, occurs due to uh, either chronic bronchitis or chronic smoking, uh, which uh, uh, impairs the lung and patient is prone to shortness of breath and pneumonia. Now, this causes systemic inflammation. Patient is giving a steroid, which leads to diabetes. And diabetes has a structural alteration of the lung, diminished pulmonary function, more prone to pneumonia. So again, these two are feeding into each other. So tuberculosis and diabetes feeding into each other, COPD, diabetes, and also HIV, tuberculosis, and diabetes all feeding into each other. So all these are going on. And unless we take care of each one of them, and if when two are together, both of them very correctly, uh, these will progress and may take life of the patient. Uh, so what, this is my last slide. Uh, what could be possible new approaches? We have talked about data, we have talked about increasing uh, diabetes, we have talked about the problems in the developing countries and India. Now there are some new approaches one can try and these have been tested and the, I have put them in my article uh, in Journal of Diabetes, Diabetes in Developing Countries and in Lancet also. For example, task shifting. Doctors cannot do everything and uh, uh, it has been seen that pharmacists and nurses when give education and follow up the patient properly, they can do, the patient can do as well and maybe better than a doctor's care. So task shifting to pharmacists and nurses. 
school based program is like, absolutely necessary in all these countries india there are some initiatives but i don't think they are uh, we need to do more health promotion using a smartphone and it is proven in india that using a uh, message a good messages in smartphone uh, can actually decrease uh, incidence of diabetes and using digital platform now i would like to specifically mention customized mobile van which we have been using for last 15 years in urban under privilege and on the right side you see a customized diabetes mobile uh, van where we can test foot we can test retina and send those photographs using a uh, skype to the tertiary care, care center we have to provide the care of diabetes at the doorsteps of the under privilege screening treatment tele ophthalmology everything because otherwise these under privilege will go on to a quack or something and then come to advanced stages of complications where we can't do much so this is very important i, I think this if applied well could be one solution for under privilege bi directional screening when a person has tuberculosis then look for diabetes when person has diabetes look for tuberculosis this is a propounded by who and we should all follow it uh, nutritional perinatal period integrated with ncd program has already been talked about by hema ethnically tuned lifestyle intervention at the workplace you know dancing zumba uh, aerobics in the community yoga and things like that are are should be very well placed because community accepts it and it is uh, that fits into the, in their daily routine and that may prevent diabetes and then finally our, our government has to really crack down on the taxation unhealthy oils and unhealthy food it is known to work in some some countries like mexico and so on this must be done also for south asia thank you shobha for giving me this opportunity and wonderful platform thank you very much dr mishra and i would just like to mention here that dr mishra has been instrumental in initiating many school based programs around healthy eating and healthy living i have been part of that at some point Uh, as stress point out diabetes is one of those rare conditions that affects several organs of the body including our lungs and it is a classic example of a uh, that abets a communicable disease like tuberculosis <coughs> i now invite dr tara singh bam deputy regional director of the asia pacific region at the international union against tuberculosis and lung disease Uh, dr baum can you help us understand the connect between uh, diabetes and tb it has been mentioned by dr mishra very clearly and also how does tobacco Im use impact diabetes and tb uh, thank you shobha for uh, for giving me this opportunity uh, and also i would like to thank all the speakers uh, for their wonderful presentations as uh, dr mishra already highlighted the relationship between uh, the tb and diabetes so i will just uh, uh, quickly uh, uh, highlight the some key points uh, as dr mishra already mentioned that the, the people with a weak immune system as a result of chronic diseases such as diabetes are at a higher risk of progressing from latent to active tuberculosis so uh, uh, in the, uh, the, uh, the statistic that we have today shows that about 50% of 15% of tuberculosis cases globally may be linked to the diabetes so uh, uh, as a, uh, as highlighted by this sobe uh, hema and the dr bisra there is a large proportion of people with diabetes as well as the tuberculosis are not diagnosed so uh, they are still living uh, yeah, undiagnosed at the, at the community level so uh, or they are diagnosed too late so there is a need to have a, the, a very integrated approach between the tuberculosis control program and the non communicable disease especially diabetes control program so uh, uh, when we uh, see the burden from the health perspective at the same time as uh, subi also highlighted in her presentation uh, there is a significant cost associated with the diabetes as well as the, the tuberculosis because of the, the uh, because of the you know the disease and the loss of productivity 
So uh, in, in many uh, cases, you know, TB is a, a TB treatment is freely available in most of the, the setting. But in other hands, di diabetes treatments and care is not widely available in many uh, developing countries. Uh, and when if there is a treatment available, but it's not free. So uh, here I would like to highlight the issue that if we, uh, we are uh, targeting to end the tuberculosis by 2030, so we need to have a very comprehensive approach to tackle the both uh, TB and diabetes. And also this, uh, the, the intervention needs to be well funded and well costed and uh, there is a need of a greater political commitment both at national and sub-national level. So one thing I would like to highlight here is Dr. Mishra already pointed out, we, we must prioritize the screening and the, the, the bi-directional uh, the, the screening is uh, very critical. So every TB patient must be diagnosed uh, as early as possible and also diagnosed with diabetes. And all the diabetes, uh, they, you know, the patient must be also diagnosed uh, for TB as well. So it is needed. So once we have the clear diagnosis, then that would help to make a further management uh, of the both diseases. Uh, the, uh, just for the, uh, the relation of uh, smoking and diabetes, uh, we have uh, sufficient evidence uh, 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 today the, as per the, uh, the uh, 2014 Surgeon General reports, the smoking is a, a cause of type 2 diabetes and the evidence that uh, suggests 30, 30 to 40 percent uh, higher risks of diabetes than uh, in smoker than the non-smoker. So the, the risk of developing diabetes increases with the number of cigarette smoke per day. It means there is a dose, uh, the response uh, relationship between the, 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 the number of cigarette smoke and developing the diabetes as well. So what, what we need to do, so we need to have a really good integration of the tobacco control program into primary healthcare settings. We need to build the capacity of the, our the primary health healthcare workers and the, the, the volunteers as well as the, the, the physicians and nurses on both management of TB and diabetes as well. And there should be a routine uh, the counseling and the, the services uh, through the primary health care services. So it can be uh, through the TB control program or the diabetes control program or in general uh, the, the, the clinics uh, such as primary health care. So when we look at the, the data of uh, 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 smoking, diabetes, and TB, there are sufficient information uh, uh, that we have at the moment. So there, there are some studies from the Taiwan documented that uh, smoking and diabetes showed a joint effects on pre-treatment positive uh, uh, smears. So uh, diabetic smoker had more than a high fold of increased risk of pre-treatment positive smear than did non-diabetic non-smokers. And a high proportion of smokers and diabetic patients have a high smear positivity. So this suggests that the increased frequency in positive, uh, positive smears was mainly of a high positivity grade that indicates remarkable joint effects of diabetes and smoking that increase the risk of transmission of tuberculosis in, in the society. So what action we need to do with the TB control program should have a strong component of tobacco cessation in a, uh, in, in a DOTS clinic or in a TB clinic and uh, the management of diabetes. So the, both diabetes and the uh, uh, TB control program should work together in collaboration with the National Tobacco Control Program as well. So uh, uh, here I would like to just quickly highlight uh, the, we should not repeat the history. The history that we have from the HIVS. Uh, we know the HIVS was, you know, the, uh, it was uh, the big problem in the early 1990s and the HIV really uh, fueled the, the, the TB epidemic, especially in African countries. So uh, 
uh, at that time we, we we still know there was very little uh, the the action to address the the, uh, the hiv and the tb uh, uh, comorbidities so that was the issue so we should not repeat now we have the evidence sufficient evidence we know smoking and diabetes are fueling the spread of tuberculosis so we have this is a really wonderful opportunities we have now 2030s targets uh, we have the, uh, the the global you know the, all the, the the governments agree to address this but those the, the international commitment needs to be translated to action at the country level and at the, the sub-national level so uh, the, the who and the union uh, we have uh, always encouraged Ministry of Health and the programs to address the combined challenges of smoking, diabetes, and tuberculosis. And uh, there is a great uh, need of the policymakers uh, to uh, to to make uh, uh, them uh, the accountable by the civil society group. The media can play the bigger roles uh, to to raise the issue uh, of the, uh, the TB, diabetes, and the tobacco. So uh, we can only uh, the, get a success if we have a, a coordinated uh, approach, uh, if we have the, the partnership with the, all the stakeholders from the, uh, the very beginning, that is from developing uh, policies and programs and implementation of the, the policies to the management of the disease control program to the delivery of the service at a, a, to individual patients. Uh, at the community level so uh so here uh, uh we need some uh, you know the larger the, uh, the prevention strategy as well uh to build the public awareness for example mass media campaigns are needed to educate public on danger of tuberculosis diabetes and tobacco use there is a need of as i mentioned earlier integration of tobacco cessation into primary health care that is really critical and the, the early diagnosis for both for the TB and diabetes through the primary health care setting is an urgent the matters. So uh, uh, just to summarize my uh, the, uh, the last points, uh, we have to focus both at the program and also at the population level. So the, all the governments the, the, and all civil society, we like as a professional organization, we must focus to, 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 uh, to, to introduce or to implement the cost effective strategy to address the, uh, the issue of uh, both communicable and non-communicable disease. And we, uh, there are some modifiable risk factors for non-communicable disease that would also help to, uh, to, uh, to control the tuberculosis as well. For example, uh, the, uh, the reducing the use of tobacco. So how can we reduce the, the government, both at the national and sub-national government, they should really adopt and implement a strong tobacco control program. Uh, the national government can raise the tax and price, uh, and the, also the, the ban smoking in all public places and work places. They can also ban the advertising, promotion, and sponsorship, and also implement a larger graphic health warning that many of the countries are implementing uh, uh, the uh, uh, very you know the uh, the, uh, the graphic health warnings on tobacco pack to really educate the, the public on danger of smoking, and some uh, some of the countries also already implementing the smoking cessation, but that needs to be scaled up. So the other uh, other factor is there should be a strong program to reduce the unhealthy diet. Uh, so the, these are uh, you know the we we, are, we have a challenge from there are many. Uh, the commercial determinants that we can say there are many other industries also you know trying to block uh, or they, they interfere the, the public health policies so we we need to make really governments accountable to make a uh, comprehensive legislation to ban the uh, the uh, uh, to ban the many types of you know the the the, the respect of, for example like the the, the advertisements of the, uh, the junk food and junk drinks and control of the all those uh, sugar and sweetened beverages and also increase the tax and prices on those products so that that would discourage the, the public to uh, to use 
or uh, of these uh, the, uh, harmful products. Uh, the third point, uh, the Dr. Misra also pointed out the physical activities. So we uh, we should have a, a, a routine practice through the primary health care uh, the service to educate the public at least to have the the, the physical activity at the minimum level, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. So, but it should uh, it should have a regular uh, through the uh, the primary health care service, the, uh, the uh, health workers to educate the public and the visitor in the primary health care centers. And there should be uh, some uh, incentive mechanism that would support the public to, to engage more and more in the, in the physical activities. The last but not the least, again, the uh, alcohol is a, is a one the the the, 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 uh, the risk factor for all non-communicable disease and even for the tuberculosis uh, and diabetes as well. So uh, the government should really make a comprehensive legislation to ban uh, and restrict the sale of the the alcohol, ban advertisement, promotion, and uh, sponsorship. And these products should be uh, uh, very expensive. Uh, by increasing tax and prices. Uh, so, uh, in conclusion, I would like to say here, uh, smoking and diabetes are both important risk factors for tuberculosis. So, to end the tuberculosis, we need to really control or eliminate smoking, and also we need to have a better management of diabetes. Uh, the the uh, other point that was also highlighted by the, uh, the SOBA, so we need a political leadership. Uh, yeah, just for example, the, we, we have established uh, Asia Pacific Cities Alliance for Tobacco Control in, in Asia Pacific. Uh, it's, it's a city level the alliance. The, the, uh, the main uh, the objective of this alliance is to make the city mayors accountable to implement comprehensive uh, tobacco control and non-communicable disease program. So uh, the actions are needed. Uh, if, if the actions are on the on the ground, so we can bring the impact. Uh, thank you, Suba. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Baum. Uh, we now invite the participants for their comments and questions. Uh, you can type in your questions in that chat box, which you must be seeing on your screen. We are running short of time. I think we have just one minute left for the webinar to end. But I think with the permission of panelists, we can extend it a little more. We have some very interesting questions. Uh, uh, one question is from uh, Padamra Joshi, who's a senior journalist from Health Today uh, Media uh, from Nepal, and he's a founding member of APCAT Media Network also. Uh, uh, Padamraj wants to know from the panelists, what is your expectation from the media to help uh, minimize or control diabetes in Southeast Asia? So. I believe each panelist can give a short and crisp uh, suggestion for that expectation from the media. Uh, yes, uh, Hema, would you like to say something? Yeah, I think um, in our country we are exploiting the media to the fullest because that is one easy channel to reach the awareness. And so much so, um, um, the GDM Awareness Day and uh, the that we have built around it. Now the women themselves are asking their doctors, why haven't you tested my sugars in pregnancy? And that is the kind of impact that it has brought about. So we are really glad to um, uh, use the synergies for um, creating awareness in a reassuring manner. What they need to do, that they should take responsibility for their own health. Physical activity from children to adult, this must be uh, exercise in any article that they write about it. And third thing is self-referral. Obesity, abdominal obesity, history of gestational diabetes, uh, family history. If these three, four, four things are self-referred after 30 years of age in India or South Asia, I think many more people will come in pic picture and early diagnosis uh, and early treatment. Okay. Uh, Dr. Baum, would you like to say something? Uh, thank you. Uh, just uh, the, uh, I have also the three things. The first thing, the media can play a bigger role to educate the public on uh, on any issue, including diabetes, tuberculosis, tobacco, 
and uh, that is one. The second one, uh, in most of the uh, countries, you know, in, uh, in Asia Pacific, uh, even in other, other countries, uh, non-communicable disease is not a priority agenda of the government. Uh, so the media can really highlight this issue to, uh, to, to get the NCD onto a government agenda. The third point, so the, as I mentioned earlier, there are many commercial determinants for entities and also the, the, the communicable disease as well. So the industries, especially the, the whether it's alcohol industry or the tobacco industry or any other industry, they are trying to uh, you know the block the uh, uh, comprehensive uh, the policies. Uh, so there is the association. We, we can see there are many uh, you know the lobbying, the interference by the uh, uh, the industry group. So we we would uh, uh, request media uh, to disclose the industry interference uh, to the public uh, and uh, also to disclose the the, uh, the association that they uh, they uh, they will have or they would have uh, uh, with the politician, especially the national the national uh, the member of parliaments or the ministers or any other senior politician. So we need media always play a greater role. Uh, Suvi, thank you. Suvi, would you like to say what is your expectation? Is Suvi there? Yes. Um, media really can uh, re help us to reach different audiences. Uh, it can help us to reach the right people at the right time. And it is very important that uh, media has the right information because they have a huge impact on uh, people's lives. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Barbara uh, and Bretson. Uh, Barbara wants to know, is tobacco association to diabetes related to nicotine or pulmonary inflammation? What about exposure to vaping, vaping exposure to nicotine? Like we have uh, the ends and uh, so many new vaping products. Uh, Dr. Mishra, would you like to answer that? Yeah, I, I think it's a, it's a multiple factors. Uh... Uh, inflammation and also insulin resistance actually uh, induced by tobacco and multiple other products which are there in the combustible tobacco, combustible tobacco. There are 500 more products there. And so uh, that and plus, of course, uh, then uh, it, it, this and along with the, the uh, induction of plaques to uh, coronary artery disease, atherosclerosis. The second thing, as far as vaping is concerned, we know more about pulmonary uh, problems with vaping at this moment, only in the United States and not in the UK and other countries. So we don't know much as far as link between vaping and diabetes at this point. Okay, thank you. Uh, anybody else would like to say something on that? Okay, we have a question from Rita, uh, Rita Vidyadana. She's a very senior journalist from Indonesia and uh, a former editor of Jakarta Post. Uh, she's also a founding member of Indicat <coughs> Media Network. Uh, Rita has an interesting first question. She has many questions. The first is, is there any good news in the ninth edition of the Diabetes Atlas? Or is it all dismal? <laughs> Suvi and Hema, would you like to? Is there any, any spark of hope you see there? No, I'm a diehard optimist and I would always like to believe that there is a good news there because, yes. you know, when the, we are talking about sensitizing the people themselves and the political will to be established more strongly towards tackling the NCDs, the Atlas very clearly projects the uh, scenario that is likely to be the forefront, the urgency of tackling the matter and i think that is really really crucial especially the low middle income countries no longer can believe that it is not their problem it is very much existent and the numbers though you know they are patchy because we don't have a strong data within ourselves but it is very very indicative of the scale of the problem it needs to be urgently handled so in that way i think it's a uh, positive warning bell for all of us to pull up our socks and get okay, moving into thank, action. Thank you for that. Yes, Suvi, would you like to add something to it? If, even if we see a rise in prevalence, uh, we also see uh, that incidence is not increasing in and good fight diabetes. And we also see that the health uh, economics, uh, uh, it, it 
varies in different countries and it is of course not easy to say if a high cost uh, means uh, good care because we have more and more cost effective interventions in order to um, manage diabetes and um, the uh, diabetes management is reaching more and more population so uh, there we see uh, some positive messages between these uh, big numbers. Thank you. Uh, another question from Rita is that uh, in the context of Indonesia and maybe other countries as well, Indonesia has 60 million active smokers. So are they at increased risk of diabetes? And should di tobacco control and diabetes control go hand in hand? I think uh, Dr. Baum and Dr. Mishra may be able to say something on that. Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I, I think uh, they, there are a set of risk factors which have to be commonly addressed and tobacco is one set of uh, one risk factor which is affecting heart disease, which is affecting stroke, cancers as well as diabetes. So I, as Dr. Baum has uh, uh, previously said that uh, this has to be integrated into our, uh, the NCD program, the tobacco control program. Uh, as well as nutrition program. So a, all integrated program, one go, and which tackles eight or nine diseases, including diabetes, coronary artery disease, stroke, and so on, uh, will do good. I think which this will make sense. Okay. Dr. Baum, would you like to say? Uh, yeah, I just uh, echo the uh, Dr. Mishra. Uh, yes, uh, uh, you know, uh, Indonesia, we understand uh, smoking is one of the biggest problem there is a biggest you know the public health challenge uh, so uh, if you look at from the diabetes also the you know diabetes also increasing in uh, in indonesia at the same time so tuberculosis is a huge uh, problem there so uh, as we uh, all the speakers and uh, the, as we highlighted uh, the, uh, uh, smoking is, a, is a, one of the key risk factors for both for tb and diabetes so uh, the government should take uh, you know the strong the measures to control uh, the tobacco and it should be integrated in all the health intervention uh, thank you in fact we have a similar question from dr rishi saxena who's the deputy state tuberculosis officer from the state of uttar pradesh and uh, he says that india has the highest tb burden in the world and the second highest diabetes burden after china and with the present trend, will, we will be surpassing China by 2035. Uh, keeping this in mind, uh, what steps must be taken to reach our goal of eliminating TB by 2025 in India? India has promised to eliminate TB by 2025, five years ahead of the Sustainable Development Goal. So uh, I think this is a similar question where, uh, as all our panelists have said, that it has to be a multi-sectoral uh, uh, and interdisciplinary approach that we have to tackle all these things together at one go. Am I right, the panelists? I, so. I, I absolutely agree. And uh, uh, Shobha, if you ask me personally, we are nowhere near that goal. <laughs> Thanks for being candid. Uh, we have a question from Dhananjay Kumar uh, from Medicare News India. And he says, I have been hearing claims of cure for diabetes and people with diabetes are desperate for cure and they are trying all these claims uh, and this hope selling is doing brisk, brisk business. The latest is uh, some claim of curing diabetes in seven days merely by altering food habits and he says that this is some hospital in Delhi which is uh, uh, saying this. Uh, what is your take on this, Dr. Mishra? Would you please? And I think the media also can help in this, but we would like to hear from oh, you. Oh, yes. Yeah, so, uh, seven days. Is... Uh, well, uh, I can say that cure is a word which was unreachable previously, unheard of in diabetes previously, and now heard of. But uh, if you say science, if you take science, I mean, these are propaganda. We know propaganda is everywhere in every disease, and this is just a propaganda. But if you take science, uh, in patients who are overweight, who have early diabetes, reversal of that is not cure. Reversal of diabetes is now possible with a hypocaloric diet and a low carbohydrate diet. Uh, and this reversal has occurred with approximately 15 to 20 kg weight loss, 85% reversed in one year and around 70% sustained reversal up to two years. 
I will not say it cure, but this is a very good news. And that's, uh, I just want to comment back to the idea of Atlas point at this point that this Atlas or such data, each country wise have set the priority for research. This sort of re reversal would, wouldn't have come if the diabetes problem is not highlighted. And there's so many wonderful researchers which are coming up because the diabetes problem is increasing and we are much wiser in every res respect from prevention to treatment in diabetes because of such atlas and because of ideas, awareness program research is going on. Thank you. There's one more question for you, Dr. Mishra. Uh, uh, Ayurvedic medicines are increasingly used in the management of diabetes. Uh, what do you have to say to that? This is a question from somebody in, in, from India only. There are a number of researchers as far as Ayurvedic medicine is concerned. And uh, we had uh, researched also when I was in all India Institute of Medical Sciences. At the best, uh, any of these which are mostly home-based or herbal-based or nutraceutical-based remedies uh, decrease blood sugar by 5% or so. And they are at the most adjunct to the treatment, main treatment of diabetes cannot be main treatment of diabetes. Now, he must be think, uh, talking also about some government base formulations which have come in. I would say the same for them also. There, the, the, the robust trials have not been performed. So I, when a patient comes to me and says, I'm be taking Ayurvedic preparation and this and that, I say, you can uh, take it provided it is not harmful for you because many have a mixture and heavy metals and so on. Please don't leave my medication. Okay, that, that is a, that's a point to be noted. Uh, Rita had a question that while mostly people in the age group of say 30 to 70 years uh, develop type 2 diabetes, it is now occurring in children also. And is there any hope for these children to become free of diabetes when they grow up or when they are adults? Uh, is that directed towards me? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, see, children type 2 diabetes is 100% due to uh, overweight obesity. There is no question, there is no other way that it produces diabetes. So uh, yesterday I saw a 14 year old child with a 90 kg weight. His weight should have been 60 kg, so 30 kg overweight. Now suppose I do something to, to decrease it by 20, 25 kg, this diabetes at this point will be reversed, which I said earlier also. And maybe he is cured of diabetes. So we can do something about it. And in children, in fact, we have to be more aggressive rather than a 70 year old. Most of the clinicians seem to think of gestational diabetes as it's over with the pregnancy and when the sugars revert back to normal and the long-term longitudinal tracking doesn't happen. It's out of sight, out of mind. And the pediatricians are also not alerted that this child is born to a mother with hyperglycemia. If this kind of uh, tracking can be done, the fitness program in this child, paying attention to the diet for this child, Avoiding the obesity in the first place, I think, would have gone a long way. So this kind of sensitization has to happen. There was another question on the chat box which said, do gestational diabetes women move ahead with a full-blown type 2 diabetes? Yes, again, it is a folly largely of the awareness of the healthcare providers because the pregnancy weight gain, we need to be more convincingly strict with them to lose that weight to maintain the proper discipline on the diet forever and forever and come back every single year for their health check inclusive of the glucose parameters, etc. in order to delay the unfolding of the type 2 diabetes. This is really, really crucial. If you're talking about prevention, I feel again as an optimist, the nature has thrown a spotlight on these pregnant women. At least in the whole population, we can track them to a pathway of prevention. So also their children. So at least a subset of the population, we can get hold of and invest our best in them. Thank you. Thank you, Hima. Very well said. And I think, again, it is important that awareness, knowledge, first of all, creating awareness, because there are so many myths still associated uh, with, as you said, gestational diabetes, regarding diet of a pregnant woman, uh, also regarding cure, the so-called uh, wonder cure for diabetes and things like that. There is somebody who has uh, some, uh, one Mr. Aurora has asked a question that uh, can diabetes medicines be taken on while fasting? So I would come to Dr. Mishra to that or maybe you can answer that as well. But I think it is important to be aware and there also media can play a go uh, very good role to 
not uh, sort of contribute to or spread lot of the myths which are associated with so many of our food habits diseases and the so called wonder cures uh, for which we keep on running to different places and that to rather the wrong places so uh, can we take uh, diabetes medicine while fasting that is that's the last question i will take because we've already overshot the time ashoka uh, shobha uh, we uh, there are certain high risk patients of diabetes we never say that they should fast and mm -hmm. fast be one day or seven day or 30 days and uh, any uh, man, try to manage the patient now we try to manipulate these drugs so that patient doesn't go into a low sugar situation mm -hmm. during the day and maybe night time when he, he or she takes the uh, dinner then we augment the uh, medicine so uh, every person who's uh, planning to fast for more maybe one day or more must consult their physician and they have a complication already a cardiac renal or i they should not fast they are on insulin they should not fast they are on one or two drugs then they can fast for one or two days with the right kind of advice and for ramadan and navratri fast they must sit down with their doctor make a plan proper plan diet plan and uh, drug plan so that they don't go into hypoglycemia or marked high sugar situation thank you very much yes yes uh, shobha we always yes. Uh, give a one liner for the pregnant women especially yes. fasting right. and feasting should be avoided so they yeah. yeah, right right <laughs> eat during the feast and then the fast also both are dangerous yeah in any case i cannot fast because the more i fast the more i want to feast later on so best is as you said avoid both absolutely <laughs> yes if i avoid fasting then then i can avoid feasting also <laughs> thank you very much uh, we've already overshot the time by i think 20 minutes but thanks for your patience and we come to the close of this webinar my sincere thanks to all our panelists for a very enriching discussion indeed and we are grateful to the participants for their engagement with the webinar it was streamed live on cns facebook page and as always the link to the webinar recording and podcast will be shared with all the participants and will soon be available in the public domain this webinar was co-hosted by apicat asia pacific cities alliance for tobacco control uh, and and ncds prevention and apicat media the asia pacific media network to ntb and tobacco and prevent ncds with citizen news service thank you and have a good day thank, thank you, you. Shubha. thank you thank you very much <laughs> bye bye